Well, Harlan and I are, are really happy to be here tonight talking to you about technology and morality and Waldorf education. And uh, I was trying to think about what I might begin with uh, tonight. And, and I went back to one of the earliest um, memories I have of thinking about technology and morality. And it was when I was, in, I think, in middle school and I read the Ray Bradbury story, The Velt. I don't know if any of you know The Velt. But in this story, The Velt, um, children in a particular uh, household of the future have a room that's their, that's their toy in a way. And they can go into this room and spend time in this room and they can turn this room into sort of anything they want. Right? And uh, as you can imagine, these children spend quite a lot of time in that room. And their parents are constantly trying to get them to come out, to come to dinner, to do their homework, and yet they often can't get them out of there. And so one day they've just about had it and they go into this room to find them and, uh, and there they are in the Serengeti. And they're wandering through the Serengeti to find their children and lo and behold, what happens to them? Well, they're eaten by lions. Uh, and I thought, well, that's probably not a very good way to start this evening, a parent, <laughs> parent evening on technology. So I'm not going to start that way, okay? Um, but what that does, um, in, in a way, bring us to is this idea of um, this polarization we have in our, in our um, contemporary world between feeling like technology is... Um, leading it, us to this dystopian world, this really um, troubling world that technology is leading us towards. And on the other pole, this idea that um, there's this unbridled uh, excitement that technology can save us and lead us to um, some better place. And what I think our task is as educators and as speakers tonight is to explore, uh, and as parents too, is to explore this idea of where's the middle ground, right? Where do we go in the middle ground? And really, when we can find that middle ground between these two poles, this um, unbridled enthusiasm that technology is all we need, and this fear and anxiety around technology, then we'll have found sort of the sweet spot, as, as in all things, it's a, it's a matter of balance. Um, I was interested in um, seeing a couple of articles in the New York Times and the op-ed um, in the last couple of weeks that aren't specifically, these headlines weren't specifically about technology, but I think that they speak to us as parents uh, and as educators in their, the undertones around these headlines. And I'm just going to read the headlines. Um, on February 7th, uh, uh, on the New York Times op-ed page, that you might have seen the article, the bad news about helicopter parenting. It works. Right, And just five days before that, in, in the New York Times op-ed page, is this uh, article, Let Children Be Bored Again. And so where are we to go? And, and what does this ha have to do with technology? On the one hand, we need our children, uh, and we as educators need to educate our children for the world that they're in. We need them to be current and to keep up. And yet at the same time, we have to be careful not to push them too hard, too fast, uh, to, to have them so busy that they don't even um, learn to know themselves. And I think that's what I'd really like to talk about um, tonight. Um, and I think it leaves us with a few questions that I want to um, just speak for Harlan and me. And, and these, are, these are big. We may get to them all. We may not. But... Um, but these are the kinds of things that we're thinking about as we, as we thought about what we were going to share with you tonight. Um, and so these are the, the four questions that um, I want to pose as I get into the rest of the talk. Um, one, what are the responsibilities that we have as parents and educators in making sure our students are prepared for the technology that exists today and the technology that's on its way? Two, how does technology and technology education offer opportunities for our children to um, improve and enrich their lives, our lives, and the lives of their communities. Um, third, how does technology or how can technology disrupt 
uh, are striving towards balance and truth and moral engagement in a modern world? And then finally, how do we ensure, um, well, one, how do we measure the balance, uh, uh, measure and balance the benefits and costs of technology? And how do we edu educate our students um, so that their engagement with technology facilitates their future and ongoing growth at Green Meadow and then beyond? Um, so I want to turn to to two things. First, I'm going to rely on uh, somebody who about a hundred years ago was one of the greatest inventors and developers of technology uh, the world has ever, ever known and still is, uh, Nikola Tesla. And, and so I'm going to speak a few of his, um, of his um, quotes, uh, a, a few qu quotes from Tesla to explore this. And the, the other part of this I'm going to share with you in a moment. But right now I want to I say something that Tesla said. Um, Tesla said, invention is the most important product of man's creative brain. The ultimate purpose is the complete mastery of mind over the material world, the harnessing of human nature to human needs. So you can feel this optimism with technology that it can really do things for us. Um, and in exploring how technology can change the world, I'm going to tell you a story and share with you a story of something else. And that is surfing. So um, let me get this set up quickly. So surfing, how, how many of you have surfed? Yeah. I, I haven't surfed a lot on a board. I've surfed a little bit on a board, but I grew up on the Jersey Shore. Uh, playing in the waves was one of my very favorite things. I still love it. Any summer I don't get into the waves, I feel like summer hasn't really happened. Um, and so I have this real connection to surfing. And surfing is a thing that started, um, people think it started around 3,000 years ago, and Westerners learned of it for the first time around the late 1700s uh, when James Cook uh, went to Western Polynesia, Hawaii, and saw people playing on the waves on these boards. Um, and it was just fascinating. And the story from that point forward uh, is a story of technological development. Um, and so you can see that um, surfboard technology is one of the first things that really began to develop from these wooden boards up to 24 feet long through to the early 1900s where the shaping was changing. Um, in the around World War II, new materials were coming into play, uh, foams and resins that made boards lighter, more easy to shape, um, uh, more durable. Uh, eventually in the 40s and 50s fins were added so that instead of riding straight ahead people could carve along the, the surface of the wave. Um, uh, depending on the waves that people were riding they had longer boards or shorter boards. Um, eventually in the 80s three fins instead of one were found as the optimal way to carve on the surf and so board technology has developed over you know the last really in some ways it, it follows you know, the, I was thinking about this with Tesla, the development of electricity and magnetism from 1700s when Cook found uh, people surfing in Western Polynesia to now, it sort of developed in, in roughly the same time frame. So people went from surfing like this to surfing like this, right? And so it's a very different thing. And it's, a lot of this has to do with board technology, but also the developed knowledge over all these years of people experiencing what it's like to surf on different boards in different waves. Um, and they can surf small waves with great acrobatics, and then they can surf giant waves that are many, many, many uh, times the, the height of this building, right? Um, beyond that, other technologies have helped the development of the surfboard. Obviously, in modern, uh, modern surfboard uh, makers use CAD to develop boards that are very specific to each surfer in each location they're going to surf. So professional surfers will have a whole, you know, closet full of boards depending on, you know, what they want to do on a particular day. Um, aren't they lucky to have all those boards? Um, <laughs> and, and then technology also helps surfing with the motor car, right? The, the, the Hawaiians, you know, would go to their beach and wait for the waves to come. But now in California, the surf safari became a big thing. People could drive up and down the coast find the waves, find where they were rolling in, study the different places to surf. 
And so, um, and of course now um, uh, people can fly. And why do they fly? Because with the technology of weather prediction, people know when waves are going to be coming to a certain place at a certain time. They can look at periods and amplitudes and wind patterns and all of these things and they can fly, you know, sometimes out to, there's, a, there's actually a break about a hundred miles called the Cortez Bank. It's a hundred miles off the coast of California and people know when there's going to be this break out in the middle of the ocean. They go out there and surf these 50 foot waves. Um, so the next development in technology that happened really changed surfing around the 90s was um, different ways to catch waves. And this really transformed surfing. So some of you may have heard of tow-in surfing. Some people caught waves with paddles, some people with sails, but then people started hooking themselves up to the back of a small boat, right? A, a wave runner. And all of a sudden now they could catch waves that were much faster and much bigger. And this is the wave that um, in 2000, it's called the Millennium Wave. This guy named Laird Hamilton caught this wave. It's so fast and so big, and you can't quite see it here, but you can get a sense that the volume of water, the energy here is so incredible that if he didn't have the right speed, and you can see now, instead of this huge long board that they normally would catch paddle in, because you have to get this speed up, that normally they had these long boards. He's got this tiny board. His feet are strapped into the board so he can get this incredible speed behind a small boat. Um, this gives you a sense of the volume of water. And now they, of course, have to have technology uh, with developing sleds behind boats so that if they get wiped out, they can pull up quickly to pull them out of the water, save their lives, and even wetsuits that inflate because as these waves come rolling in and rolling in and rolling in, uh, they're potentially going to be underwater for a minute, two minutes at a time. And so now, uh, with a car carbon dioxide canister, pull a strap and you float to the surface because you're going to be awfully disoriented if you're getting pummeled by these waves. So I hope you have a sense of the way that surfing has developed in the last 200 years, 300 years, really mostly in the last 100 years. But still, the change in surfing is much, uh, the, the biggest change in surfing, the biggest change that many think surfing has ever known is something that has just happened in the last three years. So. This idea of the perfect wave has been lodged in the middle of one's brain for a long, long time. When I was a kid, the endless summer was really influential. It was about two surfers from California who travel around the globe looking for waves, and they find the perfect wave in South Africa. They show this beautiful, beautiful little wave just reeling down along the rocks. He knew he'd finally found that perfect wave. The narrator saying, these the waves, waves look like they've been, been made by, by some, some kind of machine. machine. But there is no such thing as a perfect wave in the ocean. In, in nature, a wave is this kind of complex, violent event. I ask people sometimes, have you ever heard of a guy called Kelly Slater? And just around New York, people who might read The New Yorker, and they routinely say no. They've never heard his name. They don't know who he is. Which is funny to me, because within surfing, he's such a big deal was the youngest ever world champion. He was the oldest ever world champion at 39, 11 world titles. He's just absolutely dominant. Consensus, best surfer in history. But just as important as what he does is how he thinks, which includes how he thinks about waves. Well, he's just got a very, very advanced understanding. But he has given away that advantage with his pool. In a 2003 memoir, he was talking about you know, the ultimate wave machine and, and how it could you know, bring surfing to every town in America, make it mainstream like soccer. It just seemed like a sort of idle fantasy, but it wasn't that idle. He went to the University of Southern California trying to find scientists, and he ended up with a guy named Adam Fincham, and Fincham, who was specializing in fluid dynamics, loves a challenge and he just took it on to get the wave that Slater had in mind. His first idea was a kind of donut-shaped lake, wave that just went and went and went. In the end, they ended up with a rectangular model, a single wave that just propagates and doesn't lose energy. 
He came up with this hydrofoil shape, just pushing water sideways. Apparently very, very complex. Um, horrendous mathematics is how one guy described it. But they, they cracked it. It's a lot of pressure, like Too much. working on something for 10 years and then I think it's a big thing for surfing, you know. If... They dropped this video in December 2015 called Kelly's Wave. He starts jumping up and down. I mean, you've never seen anything like it. This is the best man we've ever made, for sure. Beautiful, beautiful wave. You know, it's so, I mean, it's like entry-level surrealism, right? This, this wave in the middle of farm country. come in and at a certain point you suddenly you can see the wave. You can't be prepared for seeing this thing in the middle of a field. And it's in a pool that's 700 yards long, 100 yards plus wide. There's this patch of ocean, ersatz ocean. And the wave's created by this huge thing they call the vehicle. It's this big sort of mad maxi machine. It's up on rails. It's, it's like three train cars and it kind of whips down the, these rails on 150 truck tires. And it has on the side of it, the key part, is this huge, I think it's 100 tons, um, this iron blade, um, kind of the size and shape of, a, of an airplane wing, what they call a hydrofoil. And it, it pushes this wave out, it, they call a soliton, it's just a solitary wave. The bottom of the pond is contoured in such a way that it makes the wave break, like an ocean wave, in a certain pattern. I mean, there are a lot of wave pools around. They've been around for 50 years or more. There have been lots of commercial efforts to make surfing waves. But this thing that Slater and his team came up with is of a completely different order. I mean, it's like the best wave you've ever seen in your life. Matt Warshaw, who's kind of the unofficial historian of surfing, he says that surfing now has two eras, you know, before Kelly's wave and after Kelly's wave. You know, that this has changed everything. Technology has outdone nature and the consequences are gonna be with us forever. There's more to that video if you, if you wanna go and find it, but um, I'd like to interrupt it there um, to talk about um, and, and explore this sense that, um, you know, th there's this moment where this idea that Kelly Slater has, this surfer, this incredible surfer, that we're gonna bring surfing to every town in America, right? That this is the, like, the, the holy grail, that we, we can, every child will be surfing. You know, everybody will get a wave every three minutes. That technology has solved all our surfing problems in a way, right? That we don't have to go out and drive the coast of California anymore to go surfing. Everybody's gonna be able to learn to surf. There's, uh, there's this unbridled enthusiasm about what technology could do for us. Um, and uh, this is where I want, I, I want to um, bring in Tesla, in, in, in a, again, in a bit of a, a disjointed way, but I think it's very much connected to where we are here because this is something Tesla said 100 years ago uh, in 1919 on the, at the end of the war to end all wars, uh, same time that Waldorf education was born. Um, and I do think that there, you know, something about this wave is connected to to what he's talking about. And I'm gonna give you the first half of a quote. He said, war cannot be avoided until the physical cause for its recurrence is removed. And this, in the last analysis, is the vast extent of the planet on which we live. Only through annihilation of distance in every respect, as the conveyance of intelligence, transport, transport of passengers and supplies, and transmission of energy, will conditions be brought about someday ensuring permanency friendly relations. And so this idea that technology can bring us together, provide everything that everybody needs in terms of energy and food and, uh, and, and, and that this is going to bring us peace. And I don't mean to set up Tesla as a straw man here, but I think we know how that's worked out, that you know, we, we can start doing these things that he's talking about, but it hasn't quite gotten there. And so we have to be really careful about this unbridled, passion, uh, unbridled enthusiasm about technology. Um, and Tesla actually catches himself 
and says after that, um, what we now want is closer contact and better understanding between individuals and communities all over the earth. And the elimination of egoism and pride, which is always prone to plunge the world into primeval barbarism and strife. Peace can only come as a natural consequence of universal enlightenment. And so I think that Tesla has it right. He has this idea that you know, technology can do a lot, but it can't do anything for us unless we have a universal enlightenment. And I'd like to explore that idea with respect to what we gain and what we lose in surfing with this wave. Because what is it that surfing really was, if not a moment or, or, a, or a lifestyle for people to go out into the ocean and connect with nature and c connect with other people and um, to self-reflect. And so now we have this wave pool that potentially everybody can have a wave right away. You know, they know exactly when it's coming. There's no moment of decision. Do I go for this wave or do I wait for the one that's coming next? Um, I don't want to say that this is not an amazing thing, right? But this never would have happened if the fluid dynamics physicist hadn't spent years wondering about the dynamics of water. And if Kelly Slater hadn't spent 30 years out in surf waiting perhaps all day for a set to arrive, right? This self-reflection, this connection to the self is something that we have to be very uh, aware of and careful that is part of our technology education, that our technology education isn't disrupting this part of our students' experience. And I think that this is what we have in Waldorf education that many places do not. Um, and I think it begins with our connection um, to the human role in the sciences, because technology and sciences are very much related to each other, obviously. Um, since Tesla's time, even before Tesla's time, since the middle of the 19th century, there's been this steady march in science towards total objectivity. Subjectivity, the feeling life in science, the personal connection through the senses and the imagination has slowly been whittled away from, from our connection to the sciences and technology. And I think that that's exactly the wrong way to go because if we continue this, um, our connection to technology will be too much dependent upon the ego that Tesla's talking about, which leads to a sense of commercialism. You know, this, this idea of this wave, um, one of the big ideas with this wave is now surfing can become this commercial uh, sport, right? That we don't have to wait for a set to, you know, a storm to roll in and produce enough waves to have an event in California in August. We can have a surfing event at eight o'clock prime time uh, on television with advertisements between each wave. And so this is the, the, this is the, the way that surfing through this sort of technology has the, yes, it's this incredible way in which we've learned to control the material world. But if we're only focused on controlling the material world and not looking inward into the soul and the spirit of the human being and how that balances with the natural world and our control of the spiritual world, um, I think that we are uh, in for a long haul to find that place that the unbridled optimism is actually um, so tantalizingly pointing us towards. Um, and I really think that with the way we teach science in the, in the Waller School, with a connection to the human being, looking for the human being not just as an objective observer, but part of the process, that's the beginning of a technology education that is truly moral. So um, I want to jump off this wave and pass it on to Harlan in one second, okay? But, thank you. Um, but I do, you, I do want to leave you with one more um, thought from Nikola Tesla uh, before I do that. And I think this, this actually says a lot. Um, Tesla says, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade 
than in all the previous centuries of existence. And I really think he's talking not just about um, electrical phenomena, phenomena or non-material phenomena, but I think he's talking about an understanding of the human consciousness and the human relationship to nature. Um, I think that's really where he's going there. And I think that that's the test set out before us as technology changes the world in ways we can't yet comprehend um, and as we try to educate our students and ourselves to be a part of this world. So with that, I think I've opened plenty of questions for Harlan to answer emphatically. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. This is for the... Thank you very much, Jim. Tough act, of, well, tough wave to surf, really. <laughs> and uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. And I hope that this sense of a kind of goal for our whole community to find a new balance in the world, not just for our children, but for the future, uh, is a one that you all share. I'm sure you do. I'd like to carry forth, uh, carry on a little bit in this uh, consideration, but uh, first I want to pose a question to you all. I'm going to give three little mini stories here, and then I want to ask a question about the three, so try to keep all three a little bit in mind. The first one, many of you may have heard of a chef named Jose Andres, who went first, uh, he was vacationing in the Caribbean, and there was the earthquake in Haiti, and he said, I, I can't just vacation here, I have to go and, and help out, and he set up an emergency kitchen. He knew about feeding lots of people in Haiti, and then uh, it worked well, and he set up a whole series of other emergency kitchens in Haiti, and ended up serving a, a vast number of people there, and then in, with Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, he did the same thing on a larger scale. By then he had set up a foundation, World Central Kitchen. And finally he did it more recently in North Carolina during Hurricane Florence. And he's served something like four million meals in emergency conditions um, to date now. Picture one. Uh, my second picture actually is, or story, is about a, a young man I knew who was a student, an alumnus of another Waldorf school that I taught at, and he was visiting a country on vacation and he saw that many of the people in that country had maimed limbs, especially their legs were destroyed. And he asked what had happened and there had been many mines and the, many people had lost their legs. And they were all just uh, lying around on the street. And he asked why something couldn't be done, and it turned out Western wheelchairs were far too expensive. So he decided to see if he could figure out, being interested in design, something that would solve the problem. And he set up a small factory in the, that country, and I don't remember the name of the country, which is why I'm uh, not able to say it right now. I don't remember the first one he went to. He went to a series of them here. And he found uh, how to make, he developed a way to make uh, wheelchairs with local materials and local skills and local people making them. And he set up this factory making very affordable wheelchairs. And the factory grew and neighboring countries heard about it and asked him to set up other factories there, which needed to be somewhat different because they had different materials, different skills. And when he, he came and gave a talk about this and he had set it up, I think three or four countries and he had a waiting list of 26 countries that were asking him to come and do the same in their region. Story two. Third story is very local. We had an alumnus of our school here, Green Meadow, Hassan Oswald, who heard about, knew about, from, was hearing about very directly stories of the refugees 
coming over across the Mediterranean into Greece, and he decided to go to see for himself what was happening there. He went to Lesbos, where many of the people were coming ashore, and he made a video of uh, the situation, a kind of narrative video. He was right there in the, with the boats. It was very living experience, and that video went viral on YouTube and affected many people's consciousness of what was happening in a way that news reports didn't necessarily. You really had a sense of who these people were, what the conditions were in the water. So that's story three. You may have noticed that two of these situations were connected to a Waldorf school, Waldorf alumni, and that's partly by chance, partly by my experience, and partly because I want to connect this in some ways to Waldorf education, but obviously many could have given many examples from outside as well. Uh, I want to ask then, I want, to, I want to kind of go in the direction of the sequence that, that was required for these people to, to explore this, because they were in a situation or they heard about a situation and many, many people had heard about the same situation. Lots of people heard about the earth in Haiti. Lots of people know that there's a big problem with mines in many countries in the world. And that there was a refugee crisis. But they had something that led them to take the step into trying to engage with the process. And the, the word altruism sounded, I think idealism might be another way of expressing that. There was some sense of purpose that they had that led them to say, I, I want to do something to make the world a better place. And this, this is somehow connecting to me as a situation where I might be able to do that. And then they found themselves in the situation. There's no food. People are missing their legs. People are trying to cross a ocean very minimal craft to get to a place where they can live a decent life. And they used some sort of creative thinking to say, well, how can I figure out a way to contribute? And there's no way of pre-planning that. You have to see what the situation offers and how to, fit, to engage in some sort of a uh, way that unites your resources and your skills with the needs there and the possibilities there. Uh, we sometimes call it situational thinking, creative, imaginative, open-ended, meeting the world. And then the last step is all three of these were success stories, actually, that there wasn't just an idealism and there wasn't just a thought, well, this might help but they were able to ground it. They were able to create something that actually made a difference. So there was some sort of practical skill, skill as a videographer, filmographer, skill as a cook and an organizer, skill at uh, technical innovation and design. And those three things are actually hard to all combine. To have one of them or two of them is probably easier, but to have all three is an extraordinary thing, really. And we're facing many, many, many situations of this dimension, and some of them are caused by technology. I was just thinking, as I was preparing for this conversation, of the many, many ways that people found technological solutions. For example, wouldn't it be great to have more crops that, that grew and more yields. We could make artificial fertilizers that would drive our crop yield up. Or we're shipping things over such distances and food and buying things in markets and things. Wouldn't it be great to have plastic bags that would be able to store all these things, a new material that would able, be able to easily store things, all this plastic in the world. Such a great innovation at the time. It was a brilliant thought, a solution, a technological solution to a problem that was arising. And uh, 
The third was a, a dis tremendous need for power. When we started having vehicles, we had horses, we wanted faster vehicles. Why not use this petroleum, burn the petroleum, and get this tremendous power out of it? And all three of these were just brilliant technological solutions. And down the line, we're looking at terrifying consequences of all of those technological solutions. But some of these problems were also caused by nature, hurricanes, by social conditions, by other th th things. We, there are many, many problems that we're causing in the world, that, that we're facing, sorry, that we're facing in the world, some of which we're causing and some of which we're just facing in the world. And how did we get to this point? It, it feels like it's a very different situation than in the past. And in a certain way, there's a kind of moment when vortexes meet each other that people call a chaos point. There's a vortex and then something comes out and you don't know how it's going to come out. And we've gone through a vortex point in our civilization. The lifestyle and the moral standards of a past generation were determined by three huge factors. By religion, which said, thou shalt. By hierarchical political systems, which said, you must. And by very rigid caste or uh, economic traditions that said your career, your lifestyle is determined by that of your parents. If you were a blacksmith's child, you're probably going to be a blacksmith. The farmer's child, you're going to be a black farmer and so on. Which said, this is what you can do. These are the limits of your existence. And we lived in a kind of hierarchical, rigidified world that worked in a certain way. It kept things going in a certain way. And all of that dissolved, you could say roughly around end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. The nations, the autocratic nations that had a very hierarchical political system were torn apart. Democracies rose up everywhere. The traditional religious systems, not so many people are willing to follow those anymore. And economically, we just have this remarkable freedom you no longer look to your parents to determine your own status and condition in life. And so this tremendous, we've, this vortex has destroyed the existing structures. And how do we find a new pathway forward to meet these challenges? Well, the only way forward is if we find a new morality, not the thou shalt of the religious life, but something that out of freedom we choose to follow call that idealism. Personal choice of values. And you could have an education that says values are not important. Technology is important. We're not going to touch values. That's a personal thing. But where, is, where are people going to find their values today if we don't offer them possibilities? So the solution of the Waldorf School is to give rich, rich examples of idealistic people, of people who've changed the world, of societies that lived in healthy ways, many different possibilities, and then to allow the children to see how beautiful it is when people live out of their chosen values. Leaving them free to decide what their values will be and in the hope that they will choose values, that they'll be inspired to choose the values that they see right, see fit to choose in the world, they see as right in the world. So in complete freedom, but educated, you're not free if you don't know something's even possible. And that education is perhaps particularly active in late middle school where they hear many biographies already and in the high school but it actually begins in the fairy tales much earlier in the kindergarten even and goes right through the school 
But the idealism isn't enough, of course. You have to have that creative impulse. What can I do in this situation? I'll open a soup kitchen, I'll open a series of soup kitchens. I'll create a new wheelchair using local materials. I'll make a video and let people know exactly what the life is really like out here, not what you see in the newspapers. You have to have that picture and that creativity, that situational creativity where you're meeting something and you just, you spark with your imagination is something that's, that's really golden. Many of us just stand in front of a problem and say, I'd love to help. What, what can one do? It's a valid comment. We feel helpless in front of many problems. And this cultivation of creativity, especially perhaps through artistic experience in so many arts, the children here are building, they're sculpting, they're painting, they're drawing, they're singing, they're playing musical instruments, they're reciting poetry, they're composing poems and stories, they're uh, dancing, acting in plays. They're just used to being creative in their environment. And when you're used to being creative, when you walk into a new situation, those habits just continue. You take a creative relationship to the new situation. And finally, you need those practical skills. It's great to have a wonderful picture of what could happen but unless you can actually ground that, it's left as a beautiful picture of what could have been. And of course, from the very earliest days, our children here are immersed in practical activities. Baking, building again, gardening, handwork, woodwork, stonework, technological work, building circuits. They've had so many experiences of actually grounding something that they want to do, and carrying it through to the last iota, that many of them tell us when they come back, I'm the one who in my workplace or college, someone says, well, we need someone to do this. No one here has the skill. And they say, oh, I'll take that on. It can't be that hard. I've learned so many things already. <laughs> I've learned to play the violin. I've learned to carve wood. I've learned to bake. I've learned to garden. I've learned to speak two languages. I just, one thing after another came to me and I realized some of them came easier. Some of them took a lot of work. This thing might take a lot of work. It might be easy. I'll find out when I do it. But I know that I'll get there because I always have. And so this goal of really bringing capable transformers of the world, people who want to transform it in a good way, people who have the creative mind to picture what that could mean in the real situations they meet, and people who are practical and have the capacities to take something, ground it, also of course the social capacities to work with others to make that real. This is really the ultimate technology of Waldorf education, because that is a technology, the technology of changing the world. I think I'll leave it there.